So thank you all for coming to this next installment in our speaker series. For those who are just now joining us, this is all part of the Pomona Research and Mathematics Experience, where we have um, two, twice a week, seminars from individuals who are telling us various histories and stories involving Black mathematicians. So today, it is a pleasure to welcome a friend and a colleague, um, a colleague in the sense of we've actually written papers together, uh, Dr. Asamoah and Quanta. Uh, Dr. Nkwanta is a professor and a chair of the mathematics department at Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland. His academic interests are algebraic and enumerative combinatorics and discrete mathematical biology. Dr. Nkwanta grew up in a military household in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Upon graduating high school, Dr. Nkwanta enlisted in the Army himself, where he served from 1974 to 1976, before being honorably discharged at the rank of sergeant. Following his Army career, Dr. Nkwanta earned his Bachelor's of Mathematics from North Carolina Central University and his Master's of Math from the University of Wisconsin. He then worked in industry for 10 years, first at Logicon Incorporated and then at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He earned his PhD from Howard University in 1997. As the chair of the math department at Morgan State, Dr. Nkwanta produced the, the department's first industrial and computational mathematics PhD student. He has published numerous papers using combinatorial and thermodynamic methods to model RNA sequences for RNA secondary structure prediction. He has also written multiple papers focusing on the humanistic and historic aspects of mathematics with his wife of 40 years, Dr. Janet Barber. We are honored to have him here today. So, Dr. Nkwanta, welcome. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Goins, for those kind words and introduction. And I'd like to thank the Pomona Research and Mathematics Experience group for giving me an opportunity to share some of my research with the group here. Thank, thank all of you for um, trying to get the right word for what we're doing virtually. <laughs> I was about to say attending, but virtually uh, connecting to this talk. And um, the title of my talk is Historical Notes on Black Mathematicians. No, emphatically, it is not the empty set. So there's a story behind that phrase there. And it started, I don't remember exactly where I learned the story, but my version of it was that uh, there was a, a, a talk at one of the major math meetings and two Caucasian mathematicians were having a discussion and one said to the other, um, I don't see any black mathematicians. And the other person said, oh, are you talking about the empty set? Now that was the version that I've always known the story to be. Of course, you know, there are a lot of myths that kind of surface up through um, mathematics. But a few years ago, I finally found the source of the story. And that it goes something like this. I went to the summer 1977 AWM, which is Association of Women in Math meeting, and they asked for a volunteer to organize next January's AWM panel. I raised my hand. Competition was lacking. So I had the honor. What shall the topic be? Judy Green pipe, piped up. Black women in mathematics. The empty set asked a voice. And that's the origin of the story. And that story is attributed to, to, to uh, Patricia Kinscraft, who's written a, a lot about African Americans and African American women and other groups in mathematics. Her, her work is, is widely published out of uh, New Jersey. And Lee Lorch stood up and immediately said, No, it's not the empty set. The meeting will be in Atlanta. And I think it's a very appropriate topic. He began listing names of African American women mathematicians. And I agreed to organize the panel and my life was changed. That's coming from Patricia Kinscraft's 
book, our paper, Improving Equity in Education, Why and How Journal, Why and How in the Journal of Humanistic Mathematics. And I have a picture here with Lee Lorch. Um, I don't remember where this uh, conference is, but it's a very, very historic picture here, but Lee Lorch. And then there's a younger version of, of Ed Ray. And then you have David Blackwell there. You have um, uh, Scott Wims, the creator of the MAD website. And then you have um, 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 Mel Curry, who was with the uh, National Security Agency at the time and was a mentor to Ed Ray when he was at the National Security, uh, Organiz uh, National Security Agency and one of Howard's professors there, Isom Heron, who, who left Howard when I was a student there, and he's now at RPI. So, so I don't, students, I don't know your take on the story, but that was a story I remember hearing when I was a graduate student, and I kind of repeated it for years until I finally came across the correct source of that by just by luck. So my presentation is going to be a brief overview of historical aspects of black mathematicians and mathematics. I'll start with my own department. Morgan has many historic connections to it as well. And then as was mentioned by Ed Ray in my introduction that I've written a, a few papers on black uh, mathematicians and I'll say a little bit how I became interested in the history of African-American mathematicians. But the three papers here are all accessible. The first paper here, I, I won't say a whole lot, but it will come up in the talk about um, African-Americans and, and the MAA, which uh, was written with my co-author, Janet Barber. And then there's Benjamin Banneker's original handwritten document, uh, Observations and Study of Decada and then episodes in the life of J. Ernest Brookings Jr. So let me begin by saying that Morgan's math department, we have various collaborators and funders and they're all listed here. I think we are a little bit blessed that we do have some funding. It's not big bucks, but when it all comes in, it helps to support the department. I'm uh, thankful for Pomona College for uh, partnering with us through NAM and uh, NSA grant just the, over the past few years. So that's been, been a blessing as well. So Morgan was founded in 1867 and we had our 150th anniversary three years ago. We're 153 years old. We are currently a research high institution and the goal of Morgan is for us to um, get to R1 level, very high research level. And students, what that means is, like in the state of Maryland, a very high research institution is like Johns Hopkins or the University of Maryland at College Park, where the teaching load of the research faculty is usually one course a semester, two courses max a year, where at other institutions, it's, it, it, it varies from three to four courses a semester, and it's very tough to do research. But Morgan's goal is to become the first HBCU to re receive R1 designation. Other R2 designated universities are universities like Howard University, Jackson State, North Carolina, A&T, University of Maryland, and Baltimore County, schools like that. Um, we were designated by Maryland's uh, state legislators as a preeminent public urban research university. Now, what does that mean? Preeminence for providing higher education and graduate study in the Baltimore area with mission of instruction and research. And I've included it. I don't know, do I have a hand where I can um, kind of direct you where I am in the slides, Amy? Is there a hand that I can? Yeah, we cannot see your cursor moving on the Oh, screen. if you can see my cursor, then yeah. perfect. Okay. I put this part including nurturing of students because for a long time I was struggling with what is the preeminence? 
And it, that, then it dawned on me one day for the role that we have with nurturing our students and preparing them for the workforce and, and getting them out. So, so this is the preeminence that is associated with this designation as given by the state of Maryland. We established our, P, our uh, industrial PhD program and our actuarial program in 2009 with no additional funding and we've sustained and grown those uh, programs very well. I'm gonna jump back to um, 2016 and Morgan was designated as a national treasure. And what we mean by a national treasure is that that is a place or a property that uh, is very important to the nation and is preserved. And Morgan and one other HBCU are uh, the only two known um, uh, national treasures, uh, the other being Howard that I know of. So we received this designation. Here is our current president, David Wilson, who's very well known in higher ed circles. This is uh, Mfumi Nkwesi, who's one of the Board of Regents, and he currently took over for Elijah Commons in, as, uh, as a congressman in the state of Maryland. Actually, this, this particular ceremony was in the building where the math department is located in the lobby, and you'll see a picture of that in a minute. I just want to say that the department's mission is to provide a supportive environment for learning, which facilitates both the professional and personal growth of our students and our educators. We have a mantra set that says our students are our ambassadors because in terms of branding and uh, uh, people learning about our department, it comes basically from word of mouth among students. This is the old building where um, the math department is housed. Um, my office is right here. This building was um, donated to Morgan by Andrew Carnegie. Uh, he was a, a, a businessman with the railroad industry. And he, I learned that he contributed like $350 million to various causes and institutions and Morgan was able to get some money back, I think it was $60,000 at that time. And this building was built, it's, it's, it's way more structured than you see now from, from the car. This may have been around the 1930s, 40s when this picture was taken. This, this driveway is no longer there, they're connecting buildings. Um, but, but in the lobby is where that ceremony was and I'm, it's an old building, and uh, and I I really it, it has some challenges, but it's it's a very nice building. Okay, we offer four degrees. Um, what I want to say here is that our actuarial science uh, degree is the we're the only HBC in the nation and the only institution of higher education in the state of Maryland that offers a Bachelor of Science degree in actuarial science. So there are other concentrations, but the actual, the actual degree. With our graduate program, what I want to say here is that Morgan is one of only three HBCUs in the nation that offers a PhD in mathematics and the mathematical sciences. Howard being the first, Delaware State being the second, and Morgan State being the third. In the mathematical sciences, um, Morgan is among the leading HBCUs with undergraduate majors who continue to earn a PhD in the mathematical sciences. What I'm saying there is we have our undergraduate math majors, they get they receive their Bachelor of Science degree in math, then they go on and they eventually get a PhD, not necessarily from Morgan, but at any institution across the nation. It could be in math education, it could be in data science, it could be in mathematics, pure math, applied math, and Morgan is very high on the list for producing African-Americans who are getting PhDs in math. What I have down here from 2017 to 2019, are former undergraduate students that received their doctorates in the mathematical sciences. Here's a picture of four young men. I, 
from 2014. They all graduate, graduated as honors. The two on the right here to your right are actuarial majors. This is a math major and this is a computer science major and they're all doing quite well. These are the two young men that were on the right receiving their actuarial awards. They're in the actuarial and the financial services field and they're doing quite well. And um, for this particular slide, I just want to point to the fact that um, the question is, is what, does, what is it that we do well? Well, our slogan is, is grow the future leading the world. That seems like a very, very challenging kind of um, statement, but growing the future and leading the world in the sense that in what you're doing, wherever you are, you're contributing to the future and to the world. And we take students where they are to where they never thought they would be. And what do we do? What are we known for? Well, there was the Morgan Potsdam model. And this name was given for a method that was developed by Dr. Clarence F. Stevens, who was at Morgan at one time. Actually, he was actually the first official chair of the Department of Mathematics at Morgan. And um, he refined what he started at Morgan in terms of his, his Morgan or Potsdam model at um, the State University of New York. And that is a teaching method um, that, uh, that is very popular today. There's Professor Stevens on Morgan's campus. This, he lived to be 100 years old. He passed away a few years ago. This is his wife. Um, I met his wife on the phone some years ago when I was doing some research on Marjorie Lee Brown, who was um, the second African-American woman to receive her PhD in math at Michigan. And they were all at Michigan at the same time. The four uh, men in the back are students of Stevens uh, at Morgan. There's Art Granger, who passed away a few years ago. There's uh, Earl Barnes, Sylvester Reese, and Scott Wilms. And they were all students at Morgan at the same time. They came in as, I know the three here did, Scott, Earl, and Art came in at the same time. They were all freshmen, math majors, and they were all very competitive. And it was just amazing listening to their stories about their their interactions in the classroom and how they were competitive and um, uh, getting through their degrees and moving on into their careers. Another Morgan uh, giant is uh, Dr. Walter Talbert, who was chair of the math department after Stevens. And he was instrumental in helping to organize the National Association of Mathematicians. Stories about him is that he, he would be at the board lecturing and he would start with his left hand writing and then he would switch to his right hand and the, 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 the words and the symbols were just as if it was one hand. He was ambidextrous with the way he taught. And there's also Gloria Glimmer. Uh, she was a student at Morgan. She, and she received her BS in mathematics from Morgan under Stevens. She was the first black female on the Board of Governors of the Math Association of America. She was the first woman to give the National Association of Mathematicians Cox address. So um, her connection, I've never met her, she's still living, but um, she was the first of two uh, math related articles published by an African-American woman, woman in A-level journals. She published these papers while she was a student at Morgan and to get a paper published in the Proceedings, which is a very prestigious journal and the Pacific Journal of Math is, is a very, very uh, good honor, especially at that time. We're talking in the mid fifties and she co-authored those papers with uh, Luna Myshu and I'll say a little bit about him in a minute. 
Um, another historical tidbit is that in 1955, Morgan hosted the sectional meeting of the MAA. And a few years earlier, Howard had hosted the uh, uh, MAA sectional meeting. So these two universities, Morgan and Howard, go down as being the first institutions to, to host the MAA meeting. I don't know where the hosting of the first AMS meeting was held. Maybe some students who are interested could, could research that area. And I don't know if anybody has any questions or do we just keep going or? Um, yeah, I'd say for now, go ahead and keep going. We're, we're gonna ask for questions at the end and I'm monitoring the questions okay. right now as well. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so back to the big three as I call them. Um, what is Morgan known for the big three? Uh, Earl, Art, and Scott. Again, they all received their uh, PhDs um, relatively close. Um, and um, here in 2014, they're receiving NAMS, the NAM Lifetime Achieve Achievement Award. And I recall a year, about a year ago, two years ago, I asked uh, my president, I said, what is it that you um, expect of your math department? And he looked at him and he said, well, I know there was a time when Morgan was all over the newspapers for achievement in math. And what he was referring to is that six Morgan students of the freshman class of 1964 earned above the 90 percentile on the advanced graduate record exam, which is a tough exam. And those six students uh, scored very high, and this was all over the, the, the local papers in the city of Baltimore. And they, they all three have stories about who scored higher, and they're, they're real funny stories. But that was that was a pretty amazing accomplishment of, uh, of those six students. And then what's missing from the, the story is that there was a female student that's from Oregon that scored the highest. And I don't recall her name right now, but I do know there was one female student who scored higher than that. And she went on into law. Okay, so um, Scott Williams um, started this website. If you're not familiar with the old one, you should visit it as well. It's called MAD, Mathematicians of the African Diaspora. And on that website, he gives a lot of information about African-American uh, PhDs, not just in America, but across uh, the, the world, uh, France, Africa, Europe. And that website is, it was his first, um, first effort in terms, well, what I want to, really want to say is that he he funded it himself and he maintained it and now uh, there's a team that's developed a new website which Dr. Uh, Goins is part of and uh, that new website will be launched uh, in a few in maybe a few months or a few years not not far from now I'll just say it that way but Scott Williams was the creator of that website and there's a lot of information there about African Americans in, uh, in the mathematical sciences. Here we have another Morgan graduate. His name is Robert Smith, and he was the president of the Pi Mu Epsilon, which is a National Math Honor Society. I'm actually a member. I actually made it into it at my undergraduate institution. And he was a president from 2002 to 2005. And in this, this picture here, he's receiving the, an award for distinguished service. And Morgan's chapter was started in 1970, and it's the second chapter in the state of Maryland. Another good project for students is, if you're interested in where African Americans are, look at other HBCUs and see where their chapter started. Um, I don't recall who was the first. I, um, 
first chapter, it may have been, may have been, I, I don't, I don't want to give out any false information, but that would be a project worth, worth looking at. I think Pi Mu Epsilon is a very good organization for students. And the question would be, why aren't more HBCUs involved with Pi Mu Epsilon? So our student chapter is called the Maryland Beta chapter. And in 2019, these were the five inductees into the beta chapter, and they all have their certificates and their tassels. And um, we have uh, two math and three actuarial students that received uh, inductee. We average about seven or eight students a year. Now, um, what is it that Morgan does well? Well, I mentioned it earlier that we develop our students and we're contributing to the production of minority doctorates in the mathematical sciences. And again, this aligns with the preeminence that was given to the university. And this is actually data here that um, talks about in general, 55 institutions that produce African-American PhD recipients in STEM fields, HBCUs contribute 45.6% of these awards. And Morgan State is ranked 15th in the top 55 baccalaureate institutions of black science doctorate recipients. And these are students here that are in the pipeline to be the next. And this is coming from a, a NSF publication. Now the question has been, well, which which HBCU produces the, the most PhD it, PhDs in the mathematical sciences? And if you, you're thinking about private institutions, from what I know, you're going to have have to compete with Spelman and Morehouse. And for state institutions, I know Morgan is high on the list, maybe number one. But that is a project that one could look at in terms of um, which student at which institution, which HBCUs, MSIs, students get their bachelor's degree, but they get a doctorate in the mathematical sciences. And you'll find Morgan will be at the top of the list. And these are students from 2005 up to 2019 that have received doctorates that did their undergraduate work at Morgan. Jill and the Samuel uh, was at RPI, Brett Jefferson at IU, Candace Marshall was my student at Morgan, and there are others here. And this is what we do well, contribute to the production of minority doctorates in the mathematical sciences. So, uh, it would be a nice project to compile the various institutions and see how that would look. I, I don't think anyone is, I've never seen a publication on that topic. Here are some of our alum. Um, Valerie Nelson, center there, she works for the National Security Agency. We like to say she's Morgan Maid, and she was the first African American female to graduate graduate from NSA's Applied Math program in 2004. So that was a big honor for her. Um, she, she, she did her undergrad at Morgan, her master's at Morgan, but she got her PhD at Howard. There's Wilford in the fawn who did his work in biology at Morgan. And he was an honor student. He came to one of my talks on RNA secondary structure prediction. He was mathematically gifted and, and inclined. He liked the topic. And so after he graduated, he spent a year at Morgan with me. And um, during that year, we, we published, I think, five papers, and he published nine. Well, we, I worked with him on five papers and he did four on his own. So he had a total of nine papers during that time. And I paid him out of a grant that I had. And now he's doing wonderful things uh, back in Africa. He's um, at Ames in Rwanda. 
where he is a director of research and he's looking at infectious diseases and he's doing mathematical modeling. Another student is Ronnie Ellington. Um, she's in math education. Her work is around high achieving African-American, African-Americans in the mathematical sciences. I would encourage you to go look at her TED talk. And um, her and I are collaborating on, on a couple of projects right now. And she's a very inspirational speaker. Uh, she did her undergraduate work at uh, Morgan, and she received her doctorate at uh, University of Maryland. And there are others. In the actuarial side, Alpha Beta, Abada, who's, who's pictured there, he's um, one of our first students on track to become a fellow of the Society of Actuaries. He satisfied all these requirements, and he works for Prudential and he'll be our first um, fellow uh, pretty soon. And there's Candace, uh, my uh, student. She's currently running our actuarial science program at Morgan. And on the faculty side, we have a very, very, I think, active colloquium series. Um, we had Dr. Leon Woodson as a former NIAM administrator for a number of years. We have a distinguished professor of mathematics, Dr. Gaston and Garakata. We have a renowned researcher from Russia named Alexander Pankov. And we have the wonderful Johnny Flint Farley, who does consulting for the movies. I would uh, encourage you to go look at his, um, his clip um, about uh, elementary, um, the sec this segment of elementary uses some mathematics and some prime numbers, and um, and Dr. Farley and another collaborator kind of set the scene of how the, uh, the mathematics was uh, implemented in that particular uh, episode of elementary. Okay, so these are things that, that have been going on in the department. I think I'm about to switch gears and share with you this book called Black Mathematicians and Their Works. I was an undergraduate student at North Carolina Central and I kind of stumbled on the library copy of this book and I, I got really exci excited about it. And that is how I learned about all of the mathematicians I mentioned before, Scott, uh, David Blackwell, um, uh, Stevens, and others. And I was able to obtain, purchase a copy from Dr. Gibson at the time. I just knew she was one of the co-authors and I wrote all the co-authors and she was able to sell me a copy of the book for like $12 at that time. I think if you go on Amazon, it's much more than $12 these days. And this is a, um, a um, review of that particular book. Uh, and I'll just read this part. These comp contributions already noteworthy in, the, in themselves are outstanding in view of the obstacles of their authors that their authors had to overcome. And that's such a true statement here. I mean, we're, we're going through some challenging times, even right now as we sit, but um, you go back into the 20s, the 30s, and 40s with discrimination and becoming a high productive research caliber mathematician, not being able to attend meetings, not being able to network, however, still being able to be successful. I think that was, that was very, very, um, very, very, very good of, of, of uh, mathematicians from back in that time. And another research project might be, it might be due for another kind of volume related to, as a follow on to, to black mathematicians and their works that was published, you know, in the 70s, 80s. And in that book, I learned of 
J. Ernest Wilkins Jr. Um, I'm not going to say a whole lot about him. I'll just say that he received his PhD at 19. He started college at 13. Uh, he he uh, went to study at the Institute for Advanced Study for a few months. He grew up in the Chicago area. He uh, he, he has papers. There are papers and notes on him at the Institute for Advanced Study, which would helped us write our article about him, uh, Episodes in the Life of J. Ernest Wilkins. Here's a little uh, caption here where he was described in the national newspapers as the black genius. This was in Jet Magazine in 2007. He also um, joined Tus Tuskegee Institute. And I wanna say a little bit about Tuskegee because there's, there's some stories to be found related to Tuskegee Institute as well. And he worked on the Manhattan Project. However, he, he did not um, know he was working on the Manhattan Project when he was um, working on that um, after he graduated from the University of Chicago. So um, what I want to point out here is some of the other people that are were listed in that book, Black, Ma Black Mathematicians and Their Works. There was Clarence Stevens, who I already mentioned, Walter Talbert, and Scott Williams. But I want to say a little bit about Luna Maishu. He was a professor at Morgan in physics and math during this time period. And he eventually became the president of Delaware State University. So if you, if you start off as a, re, a research mathematician, you can eventually become a president of, uh, or a chancellor, a uh, former chancellor of University of Maryland College Park. Brett Kerwin was a research mathematician as well. But what was new and found out a few years ago that he was a Tuskegee Airman. This is Dr. Luna Maishu. And I don't think much has been written on him, his story. That's another project that one could, could, could develop. And um, here he is in his uh, Tuskegee Airmen uh, uniform. These are his, his two daughters. And one of the daughters is the current or maybe was a past president of Delaware State. I don't know if she still is. But um, they didn't even know that he was a Tuskegee Airman. And this was between 42 and 45. And um, he was in the Department of Mathematics at Morgan. Uh, Gloria Gilmer wrote papers with him. And he worked for the Aberdeen Proving Ground. Like I said, that, that's a whole nother story to be written there. And the connection with him are these three giants here. We have, we have Dr. Warren Henry here, who was a physicist at Howard University. We have uh, J. Ernest Wilkins, who I started talking about a little bit earlier. Then we have Henry McVeigh, the Morehouse professor in chemistry. So we have chemistry, mathematics, applied math, and we have physics. And they all knew each other. And um, this picture was, uh, is granted with permission from Dr. Uh, Ron Mickens. And this picture just needs to be everywhere because these are three icons in the African-American STEM community. And uh, an, an interesting story related to them, actually it was Dr. Henry, I interviewed him when I was trying to get information about Dr. Wilkins. And, and, and Dr. Henry was the one that recommended that Wilkins come and join Howard University at, the, at that particular time. But the story here is that they're all graduates of the University of Chicago. Henry in 41, Wilkins in 42, and McVeigh in 45. What was that like? Three black men on the University of Chicago's campus. Uh, did they know each other? Did they, did they, I'm, I'm pretty sure they did, but we don't have the story. We don't know what that story is. And at that time, the University of Chicago was very open for African-Americans to, to attend. And they had a high uh, 
granted a high number of PhDs to, to Blacks and, and uh, in science at that time. The other, the other thing is that these particular three all taught at Tuskegee, and they taught the Tuskegee Airmen. We don't know that story. We just don't know that story. And there is another little Morgan connection to the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, Clater, who was a, I think the second or third, maybe the third or fourth African American um, to get a PhD in mathematics at Penn. His wife, May Clater, was a psychologist, and she um, worked with the Tuskegee Airmen at one point in time. So there are a lot of stories around the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, William Shifting Clater, and these three, and that that's just let, sitting there to be be researched. So I started off talking about the book, uh, Black Mathematicians and Their Works, as how I was introduced into the history of math. Another aspect of that introduction was when I was a, a PhD student at Howard, one summer I signed up for this institute in the history of mathematics. It was called MAA's Institute in the History of Mathematics and the Use of Teaching. And what that means is, is that we would look at original uh, sources to study history. And at this particular um, conference, it was suggested that um, a study of, of Wilkins should be done. People didn't know who his PhD advisor was, what his research was really about. And so uh, myself and another collaborator, we, we, we um, researched him and we were able to present our research at that particular uh, institute. And we eventually wrote an article on that, that particular uh, uh, presentation. But I just want to say here is that, what I want to say is that in that institute, like if you look at um, uh, the proof that the square root of two is rational or if you looked at their infinitely primes we have nice neat forms here but in this institute we were we were looking at the original sources and not necessarily what was current day like proposition 117 in this particular book and proposition 20. so that was what i was exposed to in this institute and i kind of have been using some of those techniques in my, my research in uh, studying African Americans. Um, and, and I'll just share with you um, at uh, Catholic University, there's a, a tre treasure trove of information on um, uh, Lofton, uh, Euphema Lofton, the first African American woman to get a PhD in math. And I, I was just amazed going through her, her, her notes of her real analysis course is there in a box. The notes that she took when she was taking real analysis at Catholic University. That's a story to be told. So we published our paper in the first CARMS proceedings. And that was the first paper I wrote on uh, Wilkins. Um, you can find that paper in this particular DIMAC series. I don't think it's online. If anybody's interested, you can email me and I'll send you a copy. Um, I co-authored that paper with Ketchi Agu, who was at, uh, I think, it was, uh, one of the community colleges in, in Manhattan. And um, this was a pretty good article. And it, again, if anybody's interested, um, just let me know. And um, the second article um, led to further research. And these are topics that we did not discuss in uh, this particular uh, paper here. We, you know, we talked about his, his work a little bit. We talked about a lot of the awards that he received. 
you know, he was a genius, that he, he was a ping pong uh, champion, that he was uh, Phi Beta Kappa, um, uh, that he was, um, you know, started school at 13, I mean, start, started college at 13, got his PhD at 17, those kinds of stories. But these were stories that we didn't put in that paper and I wrote about later with my co-author Janet Barber, that he was a child prodigy. He was part of an IQ study conducted by the educational psychologist, Dr. Martin Jenkins. That's a story right there by itself. You have Jenkins and Wilkins. Jenkins, who, who, who eventually became the seventh president of Oregon State, he received a BS degree in engineering from Howard. That's a story that's just waiting to be told. And um, here's a picture from one of the uh, yearbooks at Oregon where Martin Luther King is, is receiving an honorary degree and Martin Jenkins, they're on their way to commencement. So again, putting all this together would make, make for a nice story. So, so Martin Jenkins, published this paper called Case Studies of Nick, well, I like to use the word, Black Children, of uh, the IQ 160 and above, and this is published in this particular journal, Black Education. And you can find this article in 1943. And I'll just read this part here. The study herein reported has its origins in an experience of the writer in connection with an earlier study of gifted black children carried on in Chicago, Illinois. In that study, two children of extremely high IQ were identified, one of IQ 200 and one of IQ 163. Wilkins was the IQ 163. There was a young African-American girl who had a higher IQ than Wilkins, and I remember Remember Wilkins telling me that that was the smartest person he had ever met. And if we look at, you might not can read this here, but this table has the two Chicago children. And of course they can't give names. Here is the young lady, young girl with her 200. And this is uh, Wilkins even though their names aren't there, but this is, this is really who they should be because I know Wilkins' father was an attorney and his mother was a teacher, but we know nothing about the young lady who was part of this study. So that, that's interesting in itself. So this moves me to CARMS now, the Conference for African-American Researchers in the Mathematical Sciences. That's where I first met uh, Dr. Wilkins. And these were the three originators of CARMS with others, but there's Dr. Will Massey. He is the one that's been running CARMS for the last 25 years. There's James Turner at Virginia Tech and now our retired professor, our Rainey Johnson. So, so they actually started the first CARMS and I was uh, a graduate student at Howard and I went to that first CARMS and I was very excited when I, when I arrived there. And Dr. Wilkins gave uh, a talk on uh, the real zeros of random polynomials. He's published a good number, five, six, seven papers on uh, real zeros of some type of polynomial. And this is a classic picture of him. Uh, there's Dr. Wilkins, there's Dr. Blackwell. I met him at the first conference and I had known Dr. Shabazz who uh, tried to recruit me to come to uh, Clark Atlanta when they were pursuing a PhD program. So, uh, so this was the first CARMS, and if, if students, if you've never attended CARMS, I would strongly uh, recommend CARMS. Uh, probably be showing a lot of pictures. Yes, a lot of pictures. This was the first CARMS. This is uh, Dr. Wilkins, Dr. Blackwell, and Dr. Lorch there, and many other, many other folks. Uh, 
from the African American math community. There's Dr. Barnes, I'm right there. There's uh, Dr. James Donaldson, there's Bill Massey. You, you just, you know, name it there. Isom Heron, I think Fern Hunt is in here somewhere. There's Jonathan Farley. Um, and then we at Morgan hosted two of the con conferences in 1997 and 2000. Um, here's, here are the um, Stevens, there's Scott Williams, Ron Mickens, Robert Boseman, um, Leon Woodson here. So there's stories still to be told about this conference. I don't think this conference has been uh, written up properly and one could, could do a project on the, the first 25 years of CARMS in terms of many of us like myself who, who who were inspired by CARM started as graduate students and are now uh, working professionals in either academia or in uh, industry. This is another picture, one of my more favorite pictures of CARMS when it was at Rice and CARMS is in many, many uh, institutions across the country from the East Coast and the West Coast. So there's Dr. Wilkins, there's Dr. Gaston Garicotta from Morgan. There's Dr. Farley from Morgan, but he was not at Morgan at that time. And then here I am. And we all you know, came together through uh, interactions, through CARMS. This is Dr. Wilkins at CARM 7 that was at Duke. There's another, there's a very strong Morgan presence there. There's Valerie Nelson. I wouldn't be surprised if CARMS had some influence on her completing that um, National Security Applied Math Program of being the first woman to get through that. She was a graduate student at this time. Um, uh, there's Art Granger, there's Rodney Kirby, who's at Morgan, got his PhD from College Park. There's one of our former students. There I am, look like I'm picking my nose, but I'm not picking my nose. And then there's Dr. Uh, Garicotta. So there are many, many other folks there that you may recognize and know, you know, Al Curry, uh, Ron Mickens, uh, M. Tinga was uh, from, I think he was from North Carolina and she was hired to remember physics. So many, many, many folks. And I don't know how much more time I have but I'll just uh, say that um, here's David Blackwell. And um, I love this quote, there's beauty in mathematics at all levels, all levels of sophistication, all levels of abstraction. And you can take the most basic concept, uh, prove that um, point, point, I mean, point 0.999 equals one. I think that that is, sophisticated and maybe not as abstract, but, but um, beautiful in capturing this, this point here. And um, it turns out that he was a very good teacher. This is one of his former students uh, talking about him um, and his uh, teaching of a game theory course. And the student is saying he could not help but admire the clarity of his thoughts articulated in an amazing, brief, and simple way. And this is him in a session with his students at Berkeley. He was at Howard for 10 years, and he left um, Howard to go to Berkeley to help build the, the math stat program at uh, Berkeley. Um, I think I want to just say one thing about what I want to say is that um, is that again I think for the younger generation coming along what I would really stress is try to dig into the work of these individuals uh, into the work of Blackwell into the work of uh, Wilkins into the to the work of Lofton uh, Hayes, into the work of Marjorie Brown, so so that so that we we get the root of what they did at those times, 
and these and, and here I'm just talking about I, I started looking at some of his work uh, Blackwell's work on uh, approachability approachability where where instead of approaching a number you approach a vector in terms of a probability uh, a vector containing random random var variables and so I would encourage that you do that and then I, I want to transition if I can do this smoothly to uh, say just something about um, do you see this on your screen Benjamin no. Banneker no all that we see is the PowerPoint okay let me how do I switch you may have to stop sharing your screen and then share a new one. Okay. How much time do I have? Um, I'll say maybe another three minutes or so. Okay, then that's enough time to make my point. Can you see this now? We can see that. Okay, yes. This is a paper co-authored with Janet Barber about Benjamin Banneker and his original handwritten document on the study of the cicada. Um, all these things are known about uh, Banneker, you know, as a mathematician, astronomer, scientist, known for his wooden clock. He did not produce the fir first clock, but he did produce wooden clocks. He did land surveying of the District of Columbia and his famous letter on human rights uh, to Thomas Jefferson. So all that's well known, but what, what really wasn't well known was his study of the cicada. And that's a picture of him there and uh, uh, of what we believed he looked like. And this is a quote of uh, what he wrote in one of his, his journals. He, when the cicada would come and they would go away for 17 years and they would come back he studied five life cycles of the cicada. And he's saying, I like to forgot to inform that if their lives are short, they are merry, they begin to sing, to make a noise from the first, from the first they come out of the earth till they die. The hindermost part rots off and it does not appear to be any pain to them for they still continue on singing till they die. And he wrote this in his journal here, this is the uh, one of the original um, journals of his. That's in the Maryland Historical Society, and it's translated um, here to what he was talking about. And what, what he was talking about is, for those 17-year periods, the cicada would come back. So the second year they came back, then the third year they came back, fourth year and the fifth year, and he recorded all of that information and we know today that um, the cicadas reemerge in prime numbers but no one really knows why they reemerge in the prime numbers 13 and 17 and so there will be a if you live in the state of Maryland you will be swamped with cicadas next summer <laughs> so I wanted to end with just saying a little bit about uh, Benjamin Banneker, and thank you for your attention. Yeah, yeah thank you very much, Dr. Nkwana. That, that was a really fascinating talk. I, I really love the fact that you touched on so many different people, kind of woven their stories together. And I, I personally have a ton of questions I want to ask you, um, but maybe what I'll do is um, defer to the questions that we have here in the chat. So um, I'll just try to ask a couple since it's a little bit past time, and I want to be respective of people's times here. Um, one person, Nevin Etter, asks, how do you go about finding these lost stories? For example, the identity of the girl with the IQ of 200. Yeah, that's a tough question. <laughs> right. Um, I would look in Martin Jenkins, all of his research, just like I had to uh, decipher from that first line what I knew about J. Ernest Wilkins to know that they were talking about J. Ernest Wilkins. So I would, I would look at Mark, Martin Jenkins' work and, and others that have done work around um, IQ testing of, 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 
of, of black children and those from Chicago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I, I can say I was really surprised to hear Wilkins even make that statement about the young girl because I've known a lot of people. I got to know Jaren's pretty well, and by far, he's the most brilliant person I've ever met. I met Nobel Prize winners. He is still by far the most brilliant person. So for him to say she's more brilliant than him, that, yeah. that, that scared me. Yeah, she told me that. She told uh, me that. Wow. Yeah. Um, here's another question from, I hope that I pronounced his name right, Kagba Sore, who asks, does Morgan engage in outreach in the local community? What proportion of math actual science students are from the local area? A good number of them, a good number of them are transfer students. And we do have um, outreach, out, outreach efforts as we speak. Uh, yesterday, we had our opening ceremony for our SAMS program, Summer Academy of Actuarial Science that's been going on for nine years. And we had we have 36 students from 10 states. So, and, and travelers and the army fund that program. And so we do have outreach. We do have um, local students from the Baltimore DC area in our program and they're doing quite well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, here's just the thought, I, I wanted to tell you this. Um, I, I was really happy to hear your statistics that over the last four years or so that you've had three former Morgan undergraduates that have gotten their PhDs. Um, I think it's fair to say that Morgan has had more students to go on their PhDs in math than any that have ever gone through Caltech. I can only name one black student that's ever gone through Caltech to get a PhD in math. So, yeah. so you know, so I, I do want, want people to understand that, you know, HBCUs in general, Morgan State in particular, is really doing a lot. And that story is yet to be written and research on, you know, confirming that for, for you know, Morehouse is pretty high and even uh, Spelman. Right, right. I definitely agree. Um, here's another question. This is from an anonymous attendee. How can we integrate these stories of Black mathematicians into our teaching on mathematical subjects? Do you normally introduce profiles of mathematicians when you teach calculus, pre-calculus, or higher mathematics? Yes, when you're teaching a stat course and you get to the Rao Blackwell theorem, you wanna let the students know that that was a black man. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was at Wisconsin, I already knew of the Rao Blackwell theorem. And, when the, and this was a graduate course. And when the professor went through it, he was very sympathetic. He wanted to say something to me, but he didn't know what to do. So he just kind of, you know, shelved it. But yes, you can introduce the, these concepts in your, in, your, uh, in your classroom in terms of just highlighting folks that are working in probability or working in set theory or working in linear algebra related topics, you know, that, that, that's real easy to do. Um, I wouldn't say real easy to do, but for me, it was just something that came natural because when I left North Carolina Central and I went to Wisconsin, I left the HBCU very, you know, supportive environment to an environment where I was the only person of color in the six story science complex. And so I really appreciated it. So I kept digging and digging and digging. So you really have to just do some, some deep research on your own and 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 it, it'll come to you it'll come to you you'll see ways to do it and it even goes further back to the ancient egyptians i mean you start with the the, the zero one two three four five six seven eight nine that that's attributed to the ancient egyptians and you can find that in a sarcophagus and and at the step pyramid where it's it's known i even show that to my students mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So I, I wanted to ask you about this. We have a couple of questions here in the chat. Um, you, you mentioned that when you went to the University of Wisconsin for grad school that you left the HBCU environment. Um, there's a couple of questions here. I'm gonna try to combine into one. Um, one is from Megan Hodge, who says that she's a junior mathematics major at Spelman College. She asks, what general advice would you give to undergraduate students who are pursuing a math degree? 
And there's another similar question from a Jasmine James that asks, um, what advice would you give a first generation African American college student who is interested in graduate school? Um, the, the advice I would give you is to find those things that you understand very well in mathematics and not get lost on the things that will take a little bit more time for you to, to understand because math does not really come at you in one nice narrow path. There's a little piece explained here, a little piece explained here, a little piece here, and you have to find a way to put it all together for you to understand it. By you understanding the mathematics that you've been exposed to, that gives you confidence to learn new mathematics. So what I, the advice I would give you is not get wrapped up in the things that you don't understand, but understand the things that you do understand very well. And if there's something you don't understand, go back to the, find the root of what it is you don't understand and, and take it from the root and build it up because all it is is, is, is propositions, lemmas, definitions built on top of each other part. And once you, bring that all together, you'll be able to understand and, and build the confidence. Once you have the confidence, one thing I can say about Howard University, what they did for me is they gave me the confidence. Uh, whatever math I wanna learn, I feel like I have the ability that I can go and learn it. Right. But once you have that, you're gonna be on your way. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, no, thanks for that. Um, let me ask uh, one last question here from the chat window, then we'll call it a day. Um, Jayla Langford asks, what is the best part about working at Morgan State? Producing that first PhD student. Mm -hmm. That was, I cried because that's why I stayed. That's, I was in industry. I left industry and I came to academia because I wanted to, you know, work with students and, and show a path. And so I've been at Morgan 20 something years now. And I didn't, I didn't know that that was going to happen. It just sort of happened. And uh, that, that, that's the answer there. But in general, all of the students, I have a, another PhD student right now who's doing very good work. Um, she was a CARMS winner uh, uh, last year for, for her theory po poster. And so, um, so that's my joy in working with, with the students. Right, right, yeah. Well, we, we need to wrap it up there, but yeah, thank you very, very much. I, I have always been impressed with you. I've always loved chatting with you. So you've definitely been an inspiration. And well, thank you so very much. Time. And thank you to all the students and all the others who participated and thank Amy for all the technical work with helping to set this up. Thank you all. Have a, have a good evening. All right, thanks. Good night.